For a long time, we've been focusing on working with all our partners to create strong alcohol-related policies for our communities. We continue to focus on this issue, mainly here because of the lack of ABC investigators in our county of San Diego. And through no fault of their own, too few of them, too few ABC investigators are available to help monitor all the alcohol outlets that we have in our county. So that's why it's really crucial for our local leaders to learn about land use tools to reduce alcohol-related harm in our neighborhoods. Tools that address these problematic alcohol outlets and find ways to avoid draining further on our law enforcement services and our resources and our tax dollars that go to pay for those. So our keynote speakers today are from the city of Ronner Park in Northern California and they're really knowledgeable on this topic. Uh, two folks, one is Lieutenant Mike Bates, who's been a law enforcement officer for 18 years, and he helped implement a unique alcohol beverage service ordinance in Roner Park. He was the first responsible beverage service instructor for the city and received recognition from the County of Sonoma for developing and implementing a business-focused training course that benefited the entire community. Also, he's responsible for conducting annual compliance checks at all ABC-licensed outlets throughout the city. And then we also have Sherry Weir, who owns and operates the grocery outlet there in Royal Park. This is an independently owned market that has closely worked with the city to ensure the cashiers and the clerks are really well trained not to sell alcohol to minors. Sherry takes the matter really seriously. She's also a good friend to the prevention community, thank you, in that she supports several sober graduation events at schools throughout the county of Sonoma. So please give us a warm welcome and applause for our two speakers. Is it okay if I go without the microphone? Nope. I don't like being tied to a podium. I'd rather make it hard on Autumn and walk around here and she has to follow me with the camera. But thanks for having us down here. It was a, kind of a little rocky trip. Our flight was delayed about an hour and a half and we left San Francisco airport with no rain and arrived in San Diego with a downpour. It's not supposed to rain in Southern California, right? So we step out curbside and we see a blacked out Chevy Escalade or Cadillac Escalade pull up. And the driver gets out and holds an umbrella over the two gentlemen that are getting into that Escalade. And I look at Sherry, and Sherry looks at me, and I'm like, they know how to take care of their VIPs here. <laughs> About a second later, I get a text from Anthony Wagner, and it says, pulling up now in a gray Chevy Volt. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate it, Anthony. Thank you very much. So I don't know if I'm an expert on the deemed approved ordinance, but I had a big role in it once it was implemented. I wasn't one of the forefathers that drafted the policy, but I've spoke with him. He's since retired, Sergeant Art Sweeney. was able to pick his brain for a little bit, so I'll try to shed as much light as I can on it as we move along. First question is, does anybody know where Roanoke Park is? Well, I just showed you the map, so I gave it away. <laughs> I didn't know myself until I took the job up there 16 years ago. I'm actually uh, from Ventura County, spent 21 years in Camarillo, worked a couple years with Santa Barbara Police Department, and for some reason left the beautiful city of Santa Barbara for Rohnert Park. I'm still uh, wondering why I did that, but actually it, it's been a great opportunity up there to work for that department, and I'll show you why here in a little bit. So this is a little map of our city. It's seven square miles. It's a bedroom community where they have parks implemented within each of the specific areas, they're divided up in sections, A section, B section, C section. All the street names follow those particular letters. And as you notice up here, you can't really tell on the slide, but the red zones is our commercial zones. So let me see if I can find the pointer here. So we have some here that are striped out. I, I believe those for you planning commission folks, those are just different commercial zones that have different types of restrictions. This is our main areas. Sherry's Grocery Outlet is located right here off of the freeway. 
We have a Safeway and a Raley's, which is kind of unique. We have three grocery stores that basically stack upon one another. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. Yeah, the university is right here. So they border us. This is the city limits and then state property for the university. So we have a commercial zone here as well as here and a couple down here where we have some out alcohol outlets and they're scattered throughout the entire city. So I said that I left Roanoke Park for something that was unique and that's that we're a public safety department. So we do both police and fire and there's only like a handful, I think two or three agencies in the state of California that do that. It's pretty common throughout the US but not so much in California. So even though I enjoyed my time in Santa Barbara, uh, as a previous paramedic, I wanted the opportunity to explore the fire side as well. So when I promoted to lieutenant back in August, that would be my rank on the police side. Well, immediately after the chief told me, congratulations, Mike, you came out number one, you're the next lieutenant. He said, I'm putting you in charge of the fire division, which changed my rank on that side to division chief. Our rank structure basically is the chief, and then we have three lieutenants. We lost the, uh, the commanders due to budget cuts. So you're here not to hear so much about Roner Park, but what this deemed approved ordinance is and how it came about. Well, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control and the limitations that that agency has as well with staffing cuts. We noticed that their span of control was too, too great. For example, up in Santa Rosa, that particular office covers, I believe, five counties. And I know they stretch all the way up to Eureka, which is a good five and a half hours from Santa Rosa, and down to uh, San Rafael, which is just north of San Francisco. <coughs> At last count, I believe there was about six agents out of that office. So of course, they can't work every single city. We formed a partnership with them, though, we utilized them as much as we could, but we found that they were not coming into our city and conducting compliance checks, nor were they doing impact inspections, where they're going into the place of business and making sure that the merchants are following the ABC Act. Whenever possible, we would apply for ABC grants. And I, I don't recall when ABC started that. I want to say probably about 12 years ago when they started doing the grants to law enforcement jurisdictions. But they're not guaranteed. And I know down here in San Diego, I believe San Diego receives a grant every year, larger city. For Roner Park, and I kind of went through the slide quickly, the population is 43,000. The students with Sonoma State University add about another nine. So we'd be lucky if we saw a grant every other year or every two years. Therefore, once we implemented the grant, we were able to increase our alcohol enforcement. Well, when you increase your enforcement, your calls for service are going to go down, your alcohol problems are going to go down, but in absence of that grant, what's going to happen? Those calls for service are going to skyrocket again. And people would talk. Sonoma State University students would talk. Santa Rosa Junior College students would talk. And they would say, hey, be careful. Law enforcement's out there doing shoulder tap operations, or law enforcement's out there conducting minor decoy operations. You got to be careful about what you're doing out there when you're going to these places, uh, these alcohol outlets to obtain alcohol. We found that we had a lack of local control. So at the time of implementation, we had 75 licensed establishments, 50 on sale, 25 off sale. With that local control, we weren't able to place any type of conditions on these establishments as well. The Sonoma State University population also caused a problem out in the community. So we adopted a social host ordinance at the, about the same time that we implemented the uh, deemed approved ordinance. And that helped us somewhat with controlling parties. But what we found just prior to the implementation was we had some businesses that were struggling, and I have up there in quotes, out to make a buck. A lot of our general eating premises, our Type 41 licenses, would morph. They would morph into nightclubs at night. A Chinese buffet by day, 
a full-on rap DJ, Mexican polka, whatever they chose to do at night. So we're going to look at some of the premises here. And hopefully this doesn't get broadcast on the news to where these places are going to, hey, what are you selling me out down in San Diego? This is Latitudes. Latitudes came in as a upscale restaurant. We're very close to Sonoma and Napa Valley, the wine country. So the chefs from one of the uh, establishments in Napa chose to open a place in Roner Park. Well, believe it or not, they weren't making it. They were struggling. And I'm going to do something unique here with each of these slides. You're going to see the Yelp review down there. Now, I'm a big TripAdvisor guy. When I'm going to go eat somewhere or stay in a hotel, I'm looking at TripAdvisor. I want to see what their community is saying about this place. So just watch the common theme with the Yelp ratings as I go through each of these places. And you're going to see why they had to morph at night. So here you had an upscale restaurant serving the finest steaks during the day. Obviously not fine enough to, to, uh, to make it. And then morphing at night and bringing in promoters that are going to do the rap night, the DJ night. And we started getting folks from the East Bay coming, the city of Oakland, Richmond. With that came a lot of problems. I don't know if you recognize the band below there. That's Smash Mouth. So they brought them in. They had, there's an outside patio area in the back, and it kind of overlooks a little lake that we have, a man-made lake in, in Roner Park. So it's a very nice place to go, very nice ambiance. The bar area is beautiful. Um, but they, they tried to bring them in and try to do these concerts. Well, remember what I said about Roner Park? It's a bedroom community. And the commercial zones are embedded within those residential areas. So if you put Smash Mouth, anybody seen Shrek? They seen, I'm not going to sing the song, but <laughs> you're a rock star or something like that. You put them on the back patio, now we're starting to get loud noise complaints. And then they brought in Tears for Fears. Everybody knows Tears for Fears. There's some products of the 80s out here. I see you. <laughs> so they brought in Tears for Fears. We were still getting loud noise complaints, and we had to, we had to shut that down. But we didn't have an ordinance in place to, to give us the power to do that. So we had to work with the Planning Commission and go out there and measure decibels and, and see how loud it is to be able to get them on that particular ordinance. Boulevard Grill, sorry, that's the best picture I could get of it, but this was a, a long-standing establishment in Rohnert Park. It sat right along the 101 freeway. These are a couple of the reviews. Notice we're down to a one star now, two and a half on the nice upscale place, down to a one star. But read these quotes with me. During the day, this is where you would go to launder your drug money with their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on thinly sliced white bread. At night, this is where you would go to get shot, beat to shit, and date raped. And I took the rest out because it just went downhill from there. I agree. What a horrible place. Every single time I've been here, I get bombarded by horrible, horrible drink girls trying to get me to buy an apple pucker shot or some other nonsense. I would recommend, however, to stop by and visit if you want to get into a fight or get shot. <laughs> Again, nothing in place to take care of this business. We would work with ABC. They would come as often as they could to try to regulate this particular premise. But we were spending a lot of time there. And I didn't touch on, in italicized there, I have some of the common calls that we would go to for each of these problem premises. So for latitudes, fights, overconsumption, DUIs were coming out of there, loud noise, nuisances, aggravated assault, and it attracted a gang crowd. And I'm not picking on Oakland and Richmond or the East Bay, but that's who you're getting up there. And we do have gangs in Santa Rosa. We have some wannabe gangs in, in Roner Park. But when they were mixing, it was bad. With latitudes, drug sales aggravated assault. So what they're saying here in their quotes is not too far from the truth. We were having some shootings and stabbings and incidents at that particular premise. Fights, sexual assaults, disorderly house, and it was attracting Hell's Angels. Quincy's, the only one that is still in, in business, was also finding it hard. Now, he's unique. He has, a, and I can't remember the license type, but it's one of the general eating premises where you can bring families to it. But he chooses to make it 21 and older during all hours of operation. 
Well, that's going to be hard to make it if you're just going to be locked into 21 and older even during the day. So he was starting to bring in promoters. One of the things he had was this sexy Saturdays. And that again is bringing the crowd up, not mixing well. We have rival gang members showing up for the rap night. And here comes the problems with fights, aggravated assault, attracting the gangs, DUIs, and overconsumption. Look at our Yelp review, two and a half, because all these places serve food. And that's why they're reviewing it. They're not reviewing the nightclub scene or the bar scene. So what we found is it was definitely exhausting our law enforcement resources. We were the personal security for these three establishments. We were spending every Friday and Saturday night over there. Our officers were getting hurt due to altercations with a lot of these folks that were intoxicated. And as I said before, we relied heavy on, or heavily on ABC. And I have up there the narcotic <laughs> task force example. And I'm sure you have task force down here in your law enforcement agencies. Well, Rona Park, 43,000 people. We're bordered by Santa Rosa, probably pushing nearly 200,000 now. Petaluma, Sherry, 63,000, 65. Where's the task force going to go? Santa Rosa. Bigger city, bigger problems. So when we assigned an officer to that task force, we didn't get much back for it. And that's kind of what we were seeing with ABC. They have five counties to worry about. They're not coming to Rohnert Park. We're low on the list. So what can we do to take care of this at the local level? We noticed also that we had a high rate of sales to minors. Now, in talking to Sergeant Sweeney the other day, he said it was up as high as 50 to 60 percent. I don't have any proof of that, and that would be extremely high. But he, he told me 50 to 60 percent before he implemented this ordinance. We also had an issue with over concentration. As I showed you on the map there, where those commercial zones were, we still to this day have a university plaza, a little strip mall, with two liquor stores literally three doors down from one another over concentration. It wasn't regulated. And I had a third that kept applying for a license. It's um, a Mexican market. They have a taqueria inside, so they have an on-sale license, but she wanted to add an off-sale. So I had her representative from the real estate office calling me, yelling at me, why are you showing favoritism? Why can't she have an off-sale license as well? And I talked about over-concentration. You already have two liquor stores there. I, I can't have a third in one little strip mall where there's only 12 shops. We noticed also that there was a lack of co collaboration between our planning department and the police department. We weren't able to give any input or place any conditions on these premises that were coming into town. We just had to deal with the problems afterward. So what was the solution? Well, we brought, you probably heard her name, Sharon O'Hara in from CCAT, the Center for Community Action and Training. And she worked closely with Sergeant Sweeney in developing this ordinance. We did not model any one particular ordinance that's out there. We took bits and pieces of each one and made it unique. So I really can't point to one particular city that we utilized. Uh, even our fee structure, uh, free fee structure is very unique. So what we required then with the deemed approved ordinance was that each alcohol license outlet would have to fill out an application, a use permit, and it would be approved by the enforcement officer, which for the past six years was me. And I would look over it and make sure it met all the conditions of our ordinance. And we'll talk about some of those conditions as it relates to distance and stuff. In order to get it passed, Sergeant Sweeney garnered the support of the Chamber of Commerce. The California Restaurant Association was against it. Obviously, they didn't want to tax the merchants. And one of our local business owners kind of chaired that, that lobby group, and he was present at those council meetings and, and trying to get them or trying to sway them to vote against it. In the ordinance, there's a clause that everybody's grandfathered in. However, they still have to pay their fees. 
they just weren't required to file an application. So in that situation where we have the two off-sale liquor stores, three doors down from one another, we didn't make one of them move. Obviously, they were grandfathered in. They're still in those or that same location today. This is our, our application that we have them fill out, at least page one of it. So basically, everybody's required to obtain a secondary permit. They receive their California State Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control permit, and then they're going to receive the local one as well. Any time you're a new business coming to town, then you have to fill out this application, or if you're going to change your license type, you're an existing business that decides you want to have a dual license, then you need to fill out the application. If you're going to increase your floor space or shelf space by 25% or more and you're an off-sale establishment, you're going to reapply. And incidentally, we charge a $100 application fee, which I think is low. We're, we're reviewing that now. I'm probably going to up it. For on sale, if you're going to increase your floor space by 250 square feet, then we're going to require another application. If you're getting your license reinstated by Department of Alcoholic Beverage Control, then you need to reapply as well. And then there's a whole appeal process that's laid out in our municipal code as well. If, if I end up denying it, and I pretty much as the enforcement officer would go by the letter of the ordinance, and then it would go to the chief and the city manager as part of the appeal process. And there have been a few where the city manager has overrode me and said, no, we'll go ahead and let that market come in, the quickie mart, even though we have another one right around the corner. Letter of the ordinance says no, too close to the other establishment. City manager during the appeal process brought it in. And to this day, that market is not doing all that well. It's just over concentration. They're too close to one another. So our permit fees, and again, I'll get to the, uh, the schedule here in a little bit, and I think you have it in a handout. We collect about 23 to 32,000 annually. Now, talking to Sergeant Sweeney, he said initially it was bringing in about $50,000. Ever since I've been running it, the highest we've ever brought in is 32. And what this allows us to do is based on the sliding scale, it brings in funding for us to go out and do annual inspections of the premises. It allows us to run about 15 to 18 responsible beverage service trainings a year. And also, we can fund minor decoy operations with it, where we'll send an underage decoy into the establishment to try to buy alcohol. So anything that is compliance related, we can use the funds for. And there's some administrative costs as well. We try to give back to the merchants. So at times, we have a surplus. It's a very sustainable program right now, the way the fee structure is working. We're not in the red. We're always able to do all the things that we want to do with the fees that we're collecting. And even though that seems like a low number, it's sustainable. But we give back to the merchants. So every year, we make sure we give them an ID checking guidebook, the latest version. That's a tool for their employees to be able to make sure that the person they're selling to has a valid ID no matter what state it is, because it covers all the 50 states and the Canadian provinces. And in the RBS training, we spend a great deal of time teaching them how to check an ID and how to find the security features. So for my law enforcement friends here, you know that there's a UV image that's going to show up on many of the driver's licenses. But you need a UV light to be able to bring that out. And there's microprinting. Well, you need a magnifying glass to be able to find that as well. So we provide that to all of our merchants as a tool for them to use. So here's our sliding scale. The amount that you're going to pay ranges from $75 to $1,500 a year. Oh, this is just Sherry showing an example of one of the uh, UV lights we passed out one year. And we gave them all a lanyard, and there was a little magnifying glass on it as well. But what they find is when they put these at the check stands, they end up walking away. and. So for example, Safeway, Rayleigh's Grocery Outlet, our large big box stores, Food Max, we would put them at every register. And that way there was no excuse. The merchant had it there at their disposal or the employee had it. So $75 to $1,500, and we base it on your hours of operation, your volume of sales, which is on the honor system, because I don't have the time to research everybody's books, 
to see how much they actually sell an alcohol related product, but we can do that. And police calls, so number of calls for service. Well, here's where Sergeant Sweeney and I differed a little bit. He would put every call for service into that fee structure. I have our records personnel weed out the calls that are not alcohol related. And then sometimes we'll even go a little bit further. If an officer initiated, uh, say they're driving down the road and they pull somebody over who's suspected of driving under the influence and they pull in the parking lot a grocery outlet. Well, as they call location, it's going to show grocery outlet. And it could generate one hit against Sherry's business. But when we dig deeper into that call, we'll notice that it was self-initiated by that officer. So why punish her for that? So we try to, to make sure that we're not charging too much. And I've had merchants call me or business owners and say, hey, my fee went up $250. Can we look at this? And we will analyze it and we'll drop it down if, it's, if we see the need. So basically, it puts them into risk category, low, medium, and high with that sliding scale. And when we go out and do our annual inspections, we're going to double check the hours of service so our hours of operation. So somebody may put on their application, well, we're closing at 10, but we go out there and on the door it says close at midnight. Mm -hmm. And then we'll adjust it and charge them more that year or the following year. So the duties of our enforcement officer, which is now Sergeant Dale Utex since I've moved on, it's an ancillary assignment. It's not a full-time job. They do it above and beyond all their other duties. They're responsible for coordinating and, and conducting all the responsible beverage service trainings. When Sharon O'Hara with CCAT first started with us, she was the provider of the RBS program. We supplemented her by providing instructors. About four years ago, I wanted to bring it all in-house. Remember, we talked about the local control. I wanted control of everything. So now we take all the reservations, and we put on all the trainings. And what that allowed me to do is be flexible. Remember, this is all about working with those, those business owners. We had a set schedule. Our RBS trainings were like Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, 8 to noon, or 1 to 5. And there was really no flexibility in that. I took the program to the place of business. And that was kind of a unique model. So instead of having a nice controlled conference room like this, where I'm presenting my course, we were at Sherry's and the students, the employees were sitting on milk crates. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this isn't gonna work. This is crazy. What am I getting myself into? And I'm projecting my PowerPoint on a wall. And I'm thinking four hours on a milk crate and it was the best class ever. I mean, it was the most fun class. Why? Because they were in their comfort area. They weren't sitting in some stale conference room. They were at their place of business and they lit up. We had the best time. I'm sure they had some great marks right here when they stood up, but there was no complaining. And I was more concerned about them. I'm like, are you guys sure you don't want to go find some boxes, some Charmin maybe to pat it a little bit? <laughs> and they were completely content. The site inspections I've alluded to and talked quite a bit about, it helps bring them into compliance. We don't go in there as heavy hitters. Our chief is big on, like all the other chiefs in this room, community-oriented policing. Getting out there and contacting your businesses. And our officers on patrol actually have to do one contact a night. And I'm like, chief, we're doing 12 a month, just with this program here. And we would go out and make sure that they're all following not only the conditions in our local ordinance, but also the requirements of the ABC Act. And we, most of the time, could get them right into compliance that day. Oh, you're missing this cancer pregnancy warning sign. I know it's not pretty, it's a photocopy. You can make it pretty, you can put it on pretty paper, and we would mount it to the wall right then and there. Done, checked off. Very rarely did we have to go back a second or third time. Sometimes we did. We would check and make sure everybody is meeting the requirement for RBS, which states you must attend the training within 60 days of employment. But it's tough. I mean, there's a lot at 75 establishments times how many employees. It wouldn't be uncommon to find somebody who's been working for 15, 20 years and hadn't had RBS yet, even though we implemented it seven years ago. But we would check to see their cards. 
the second visit a year later, okay, hey, you remember last year you had five people that needed RBS, you have four still that need it. The third year, you still have those four. And we would get a little bit stricter each and every visit, but still, it's about a meet and greet opportunity with the merchants, building that relationship. The uh, enforcement officer will also set up the minor decoy operations and put those into place. And they're a liaison to ABC. So if we ever have an issue with a revocation, ABC will contact that enforcement duty officer and discuss the possible ramifications. Are we going to allow that business to transfer that license to another community? Are we going to allow them to sell the license? Or are we just going to take it from them? So there's a lot of collaboration between the two agencies. And he's also the tax collector, at least I was. We never had to send anybody to collections because I would show up to the business and, and they would get out their checkbook and write it right there. So this graph here is that same map I showed before. But when they originally implemented the ordinance, they had a 1,000 foot setback. So you'll see here for type 41s, your general eating premises, there's no restriction. We could have 20 of them in a row and they could all be within 100 feet of a church, a school, a hospital, a playground. With off sale and on sale 40, 42, and 48, different restrictions. You have to be 1,000 feet from schools, parks, playgrounds, churches, hospitals, and other off-sale premises of 11,000 square feet or less. So we don't care if we have Grocery Outlet, Safeway, and Rayleigh's all stacked up, but we don't want mini market, mini market, mini market. They're all less than that 11,000 square foot mark. Any planners here, planning commissioner folks, the city level? What do you see wrong with this map with my commercial zones? Yeah. <laughs> So this is the big political pressure that I had to face when I took over the ordinance from Sergeant Sweeney. Uh-oh, we have a 40% vacancy rate in our commercial areas in Roner Park during the height of the recession. What are you going to do about it, Mike? We've got 7-Eleven that wants to come in. We have all these quickie marks that want to come in. And you're pushing them all over here. That's the only place they can go because of the setback. So we had to reevaluate it and change it to 500 feet. And I think that happened about three years ago. We met no resistance from anybody in the community at, at all. And it was open to public hearing and there was zero issues with it. And even changing it to 500 feet, making it less restrictive was okay. We also had to remove churches because what's happening with churches? They're popping up in commercial areas and we're like, oh no, we didn't think about that when we implemented this. Now we're really restricting ourselves. So here's the benefits that we've found since we've implemented this deemed approved ordinance. How does the city benefit? Well, local regulation and the police are now involved. As soon as the planning department gets that application to bring the business into town, they're shooting us, shooting us uh, the information so we can contact the business owner and shoot out our application for the use permit. As I told you, it's sustainable. It's self-funded. We never touch the general fund at all. And I think to date, we probably have about a $15,000 slush fund still in there that we haven't spent. We've noticed that there's a decrease in sales to minor cases, and I'll show you some graphs here in a little bit. We're able to hold the owner responsible. A lot of these administrative cases aren't getting tied up at the state level with ABC for a year. We're able to deal with it and have it finished in a couple months. There's a, for the business, I can't... <laughs> speak enough about the relationship that we have with our businesses. And they don't all love us. Majority of them do. Sherry does. Of course, I told her we were going to SeaWorld. That's how I got her down here. <laughs> when she walked in this room, she's like, this is not SeaWorld. <laughs> but we're decreasing their risk. And maybe Sherry can speak to this. But my understanding is by taking RBS training that there's a decrease in insurance premiums. I've heard this from some of our other corporate businesses. And it's reducing their liability, reducing the potential fines that are out there that they're going to have to pay as an administrative violation or for administrative violation. And the biggest thing is it's increasing their safety. It's teaching them how to deal with over-service issues. 
So they don't have these fights, these aggravated assaults occurring in their business. So here's the graph that I told you about. Since we implemented it in 2007, the blue shows the amount of licensed premises we had at the time. The yellow shows how many we visited. So no, we're not showing favoritism, but realize a lot of our license holders are people that work out of their house. We're, we're in the wine country. And I can't send a decoy to their house to try to buy wine. It could be mail order, they could be a distributor, whatever it may be. The red is how many violations we had. So in 2007, we had about 19 violations out of around 54 visits. We were able to reduce it way down in 2012, but we didn't go out and, and hit the pavement that hard either, as you can see. We only went to about 25 places. And in 2013, it crept up a little bit. And then the green one, notice there's no green from 2000 to 2011. What we would do is when we would go out and make a case, is we would ask the person who actually made the sale, have you been to RBS training? And it's on their honor, and they would tell us yes or no. Well, I took pride in the first five years that, or four years there, that everybody had not been to training yet. And then we had a couple of hiccups in 2012. We had two people that we arrested that had been to RBS. And then in 2013, we just had another one last year. Here's the graph. So we were up at about a 34% furnishing rate. Remember, Sergeant Sweeney said 50 to 60 before implementation. He, he might be accurate. He might be right. We've been able to decrease it and then just a little increase in 2013. And the decoys that we're using are young. I mean, they're 16, 17 years old. They're baby-faced. And the people that were selling to them, a lot of them weren't even checking ID. They just became complacent. So here's the establishments that we were able to deal with after implementation. So remember I talked about that Chinese buffet? Well, somehow JK's Four Season Chinese Buffet, turning into a nightclub at night, the name didn't make sense. So a few years later, they changed it to Stingers, and it became more of a sports bar that would still morph at night and become a nightclub. They had three sales to minor cases within a three-year period. Most of you probably know that's revocation under the ABC Act. We did two of the sting operations. Unbeknownst to us, ABC slipped in there somewhere in the middle and did their own. Well, what was unique about the one ABC did is what stingers would do at night is they would put a piece of tape, yellow tape, down the middle of their floor. And as they checked ID, if you were under 21, you had this side of the room. If you were over 21, you were on that side of the room. And an invisible wall in between where no passing of drinks would ever take place. But what happened was they went in there and they observed somebody passing a drink and a minor over there consuming. And that's how they got their second hit. We spent a lot of time with these business owners trying to help them providing them additional training. We placed a condition on them that they had to have security officers posted during the Friday and Saturday night bashes because we were over there all the time dealing with these fights, overconsumption, DUI, loud noise, nuisances, attracted gangs. And even though they were in a commercial zone, there's apartments right across the street. They built this large apartment complex. So Sergeant Sweeney's out there with a decibel meter going, oh, every time you guys open the door, <laughs> it's not good. So literally, the security guards would go like this. Can I see your ID? OK, get in. And open and close the door real quick. And you would just get this wave of noise going out. Well, it drove the, the residents nuts having to listen to that. Then they brought in Devin the Dude, nice guy here, and, and brought in that type of rap music again, and I'm not only picking on rap music, they did some Mexican polka, we didn't really have too much issues with that, it was the mixing of the gangs that was the issue. You could get rival gangs coming from Oakland, Richmond, or Santa Rosa, wasn't good. Look at, what's that? Yeah, he was, he was promoting that. I don't know if they ever caught him inside with it, but you know, obviously he was definitely promoting. Well, if you, you can't see it, but when it flips over here, the people that want to legalize marijuana in California were supporting Devin the Dude and the promoter. 
But look at the Yelp score. So even when they turned into a sports bar, one and a half stars. And they were that way as JK's too, one and a half stars. So poor food means no money. When we made the third and final case against them, I had talked to the owner. I said, man, you, gotta, you have to be on your game. You need to make sure your employees are checking these IDs and our decoys. There's no tricks. Our decoys are carrying their true ID and they're 16, 17 years old. So I happen to be working that one. We send the decoy in. She sends me a text. I've got a beer in front of me. I go in there and here's this converted buffet place, now a sports bar with TVs. She's the only one sitting in there all by herself at a table. And there's one guy playing billiards in the corner. And the owner's in the back in the office and the gal that sold to her was brand new. They'd only been on the job three weeks. Didn't even ever look at her ID. And I looked at the owner and she's in tears like, I'm gonna lose my business. I go, what? If I was the owner, I would have told all my employees, if somebody comes in to buy alcohol and they look young, come get me. Let me check the ID, because my business is on the line here. What can we do? We can only hold their hands so much. They were not allowed to transfer their license, but they were allowed to sell it. So we had a heart. We at least allowed them to sell their, their uh, license and get some money back, but they are no longer in business. Food Max, three strikes against them, still in business today. Again, not showing favoritism, but they were not a disorderly house. They were not a problem premise. They just had employees that are really poor at checking IDs. And we have since provided them additional training, have had no issues. And we've tested them three times since they received their third strike. Whoops. Uh-oh, Anthony, I broke it. <laughs> That's the end. Down in the corner here, Subway to Sorrel gas station. Three strikes, removed from business. I mean, when you go to a mini market slash gas station, when you walk in, you generally expect to find something on the shelves. He had nothing on the shelves, not even munchies. He had beer and some really poorly made Subway sandwiches. And even that, I don't think he had enough meat in stock to make what you wanted. So poor business practices. On their third strike, he was pretty much bankrupt anyways. Sunny Thai Cuisine yelled at me every time I'd go in there and do an inspection. It's people like you and government that is making it hard for small businesses to thrive. And she's not the only one. I got yelled at a lot over that. You know what her fee was a year? $75. And I realize as a business owner, you're looking at fire inspection fees, health department fees, our deemed approved ordinance fees, $75 a year is all she had to pay. Every time I walked in there, no customers. I don't have the Yelp review, but I'm sure it wasn't great. But what I noticed during our inspection is hard alcohol. There was vodka in there. And she goes, we use it for cooking. Now, I love Thai food. I've tried to make it myself. But none of the recipes that I know of call for vodka. <laughs> Nor is vodka really the choice when it comes to cooking. So I said, what's this here for? I'm oh, cooking, okay. So we decided, all right, you yell at me all the time. We're gonna come watch you on our next operation. And we just sat, and myself and an ABC agent sat in the car and watched after they closed. And here it comes, and whoop, up comes the karaoke machine. Everybody comes in, they're all drinking hard alcohol, private parties at night. And we didn't, you know, we ended up starting to take action against them, administrative action. But she uh, went out of business anyways because she wasn't making it. But by having that ordinance in place, we were able to pay for the overtime to have us sit there and watch their practices, as opposed to just go, no, you, you can't have this, and throw it away. Additionally, she was doing retail to retail transfers too. She was buying alcohol at Costco, selling it in her business, which you can't do as well. You have to go through a distributor. So here's that map I talked about after we decreased it to 500. It opened it up a little bit. And we've had several businesses come in and we haven't seen an increase in problems. So some future challenges. So Nova State University just built this beautiful state-of-the-art green music center, which brings in opera singers, the famous pianist, Lang Lang, is that it? Everybody's looking at me like, okay, you're not into the arts. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful facility that borders Roner Park. 
They do the art teak wood in there. I think each chair costs $450. It's all climate controlled. So if you go in there and you sweat heavily, you're going to get air conditioning. If you go in there and put your jacket on, you're going to get a little heat. But notice how it opens up into this beautiful area where people could sit here. And you're either going to be inside listening to music, or you're going to be out here and be able to enjoy these concerts. So far, it's doing OK. Here's the rendition, the artist's rendition. Notice this little white tent out there. Bunch of people in the crowd. What do you think is going to happen down the road? Beer yeah, <laughs> beer garden. And right now they're saying no, but I'm telling you, th th there was a lot of donations that went into this building, but it's going to be expensive to maintain. And we love having it. It's a, they're great neighbors. But we see down the road, we're going to have probably not Tears for Fears anymore. I think they're pretty much washed up. Well, they could have, uh, I don't know, who's, who's out there right now? Justin Bieber. Justin, Be <laughs> Justin Bieber. Yeah. And there won't be any marijuana involved in that one at all. But we don't have any influence over this. State property, our ordinance doesn't cover it. But we could definitely have folks coming into our community as a result of it. And then, I think we just beat out San Diego with the largest gaming casino in California. I think we have 3,000. How many slot machines do you have? Ours are over 3,000. They're saying it's the largest in Northern California, but I thought it was the largest in California. So right here in that white space, again, within the city's sphere of influence, it's now been deemed tribal lands, and it's a uh, casino. Beautiful state-of-the-art facility. This is what we have right now. They're going to be expanding with this six to seven story hotel. No jurisdiction over it. They are following the state ABC laws, but I can't go in there and mandate RBS um, or go in and do inspections and stuff. So these are some things that we're going to be having to look at down the road and how, how can we fit this into our ordinance and what can we do. All right, Sherry. I'll talk about it. Okay, come on up. So to speak on Sherry's behalf, and she'll be happy to answer questions for you here when we wrap it up shortly. She didn't receive any pressure when she came in. and She actually implemented her business during the uh, deemed approved ordinance. She supports it. She's found no financial hardship as a result of it. She finds that the fees are nominal, 650, 750-ish. And it really is a level playing field based on our sliding scale. And that's what I'm finding from most of our merchants. And incidentally, the only ones that have ever yelled at me about it are the ones that are paying the $75 a year. <laughs> Safeway pays $1,500 a year. Safeway sends their employees every year to RBS. The requirement is every three for refresher. So there's buy-in right there. Or they're really worried about their employees. She finds the benefits of RBS training. She likes the compliance checks, having that interaction with the officer when they come in on an annual basis. And that partnership that she's built, she's found, other than an incident that occurred recently, she's found that our officers are really approachable. And she has no problem calling the police. Because it's kind of an interesting thing. In RBS, we tell them that they have a responsibility to prevent objectionable conditions from occurring. But yet, if you call us, we're going to nail you. <laughs> It's going to change that sliding scale and you're going to pay more. But the conversation we had with Eric and Anthony, she put that to rest. She said, it's a peace of mind for me knowing that they're going to come out. I mean, we have a responsibility to, but that they're, they're going to respond quickly. And I could sleep at night knowing my employees have that at their disposal. Because why, why are people that are intoxicated gravitating to your establishment? Do you have loose policy where you're selling those people and words getting out? We're going to look at the totality for sure. Real quick, I just have this up here because I'm actually going to post management school here in San Diego starting two weeks from now. So I'll be flying down February, March, April. If you want to take me to dinner, I'm available. <laughs> Happy to go out. But in all seriousness, if you want to have a private conversation regarding the ordinance, uh, the end of February, spring break in March, and uh, middle of April. I will get that for you. I'll check after. Yeah, I'm just going to put a little plug in now. We have an alcohol policy panel YouTube channel. So everything that you just saw is going to be on the YouTube channel on and in how many days? 
Put you on the spot. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. In fact, the last three or four breakfasts have been on the YouTube channel. So check that out. We're going to take questions. I'm going to ask you some questions, Sherry. Put you on the spot. So what we have often heard when a city puts in a deemed approved ordinance is before that happens, and I think we're seeing this in uh, at least one community here in San Diego County, as you hear the retailers say, we're going to self-police and we're going to handle this issue on our own and we don't need uh, law enforcement to come in and check up on us. We can handle it on our own. Did you hear that from the retailers around our park? And what's your thoughts on that? Did that come up? And what was your, I'm giving you two questions here. First off, did that come up, the self-policing issue? No, I actually crossed. When it was being implemented, I was opening my business. I actually did not, I, I didn't hear anything from the establishment that was fighting it to start with. So they didn't come to me and say, don't do this, we'll do this ourselves. Um, when I came on and opened my business and it was already in place, it was just kind of slipped in. I first got the bill, okay, what's this for? Not a, not a problem. I had already made my partnership with the police department at that point in time anyway. So it was just an added security that I had, knowing that my people would get the training that they needed. And, and, so. and your fee is, you're what, 700, 800, so you're kind of in that mid-range uh, on the fee schedule. And what do you think about that fee? Because again, as Mike was saying, you get a lot of the, the retailers that say that's going to put us out of business. Part of my fee is the $250 that I pay each year, which is what it was this year, for additional calls to my business. Um, so I don't mind paying the additional calls to my business, knowing that when I leave my business, my employees know, many of my employees know our police department by name. They know that when Officer Kelly comes in, it's, you know, hey, how's it going? Um, when I leave my business, my people are empowered to be able to make a judgment call. They know that if they have to call around for PD, they're there. Um, they know that we don't look at a, at a $250 assessment as a hardship on the business. It, it's a security for us. Mm -hmm. Kind of similar to like the city of El Cajon, it's a pioneer with the crime-free multi-housing program. That program, it's, it's with apartment managers and making sure the apartment complexes are safe. But it's kind of the same way in that the managers of the apartment complexes now have that relationship with the police department and feel like they could call them at any time and report any problems. So you feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, the fee has actually uh, benefited you. It's been a benefit. Absolutely. I, I don't look at the fees that are going into this at all as a hindrance to my business. It's, you know, businesses will say it's a cost of doing business. Um, businesses can say it's going to run me out of business. Um, I don't look at it at all. I'm considered a small business in the realm of the Safeway and Costco and Rayleigh's. I'm considered a small business. If I can afford it, so can everybody else. It's, it's, it's a security to me. We go through the training. Um, I'm a beast when it comes to the training. I'm a beast when it comes to enforcing of it. Um, I, I don't take it lightly. Sonoma State students know that my store is not the place to go to buy alcohol. I'll tell you right now. They know that if they come in and they're underage, they don't get sold to. And if they come in at a party of two, and they're both minors, they don't get sold to. If they come in at a party of two, one's 21 and one's 20, they don't get sold to. Simply because we know when it leaves the store, it's a party somewhere. So my policy is at the store, um, I don't hide my age. I'm almost 53. I tell my employees, if you look at me and you think I'm underage, you better card me. If you look at somebody who's older and gray, give them the respect that they deserve. Don't card me. Give them the respect that they got to the age by being older and gray. On the flip side of that, I have a 27-year-old that works for me who's totally gray. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it's a real, it's, um, training is everything. The, the RBS training is, is so important. 
I have a class that we're going to in a week where I have 17 employees, 13 employees going. And as the crew changes, we go. I always send a manager to those classes so that in case something is new, the manager can bring it back. Um, the fees are just part of doing business. Just to touch on real quick, that relationship building and that enforcement officer, they almost become a personal officer for our, our businesses. Remember back in the day, and I don't know if you have it down here, especially for my law enforcement folks out here, you would have a COP officer. They were assigned a particular district. And I know we had that in Santa Barbara and lost it with budget cuts. I mean, we don't have that anymore. So that officer almost becomes the COP officer for the entire city. Target and Walmart every year would email me, hey Mike, we're gonna be covered right for Black Friday. You're gonna have a presence out there for Black Friday. So as opposed to having to call the main seven digit number and go through dispatch or records and be routed to maybe the watch commander of the day, they can reach out to that person that they've had contact with on a regular basis and know that it's gonna be taken care of. And even though it wasn't my responsibility, maybe for that particular patrol division working that night, I'd shoot it out to the sergeants and say, just a reminder, Black Friday, have a presence at Target and Walmart. So you can't take that away.